So I'm going to, with your permission, I'm going to read my introduction. The reason I'm doing that is because I've tried to wordsmith it really, really carefully, and it really sets the tone for the next three weeks. So I'm going to just read it word for word. So throughout the years, I have struggled to find workable, biblical answers regarding the perplexities and the challenges of life. In my journey as a Christian, I have suffered many failures and setbacks. Several of these difficulties occurred because of my own lack of knowledge and others because of my sinful pride. As a father, husband, and minister, I've also made numerous mistakes that have brought difficulty and unwanted change to those around me. There were also times when difficult changes came through circumstances that were just completely out of my control. I have learned that when life happens, God will be faithful to walk with me through it all. He has provided friends, mentors, and spiritual fathers to encourage and instruct me all along the way. The Holy Spirit has been faithful to teach and to speak to me even in those times when I was not eager to listen. If you have struggled to overcome troubling situations, whether of your own making or ones that are beyond your control, I want you to know this morning that there's great hope. No matter what the situation, what the failures are, what the challenges, when all that life can throw at us is said and done, his word holds the keys to life and victory over the schemes and the enemy. I believe that. I do believe that. So my hope is that over the next three weeks, there will be something that is said that really speaks personally to you, to your situation, whether it's something that you're facing currently, trying to get over from the past, or perhaps a surprise just waiting right around the corner. So the first thing we've got to understand is is the difference between the grace of God and demonic activity. I know much of what I'm going to say this morning You've heard, there's very little that you're going to hear that you haven't heard perhaps numerous times. But there are seasons in life where we need to go back and kind of visit the beginning to be refreshed. Jesus is our advocate. The devil is our accuser. Jesus is our mediator. And the devil is our adversary. Jesus is a friend of sinners I'm one of them. (laughs) Satan is the tempter. Jesus is faithful and he is true. And the devil is the father of lies. John 1, 17, grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. The word grace is charis. And when applied to the Christian, it it, it has a very powerful meaning because the grace that God gives to you and I is his specific attention. It's his influence. It's his touch that enables us to face whatever the situation is that we are going through in the moment. If it were not for the grace that we receive from him, as Pastor Paul mentioned several weeks ago, there would be no hope. Grace comes first, hope comes second. And sometimes in the situation that we're in, we just need a whole lot more grace. We just, we just simply do. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes except to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. That key word more, it's very important. He didn't just say, I came that you would have life. 
I didn't just come that you would have it abundantly. I came that you would have it in an increasing way in more than you have received in times past, more abundantly. But you see, there is an adversary. And I know that you're not going to like what you're about to hear, but he hates you. And the only reason he hates you is because you bear the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he truly does hate. But he can't get to Jesus. He can't get to him, but he is desperate to hurt his heart, and so you become the target. Because if he can hurt the child of God, he can wound at the heart of the Father because the Father's love for you is that extraordinary. It's that extreme. And that puts you in the bullseye. It puts you in the bullseye. First Peter 5, 8, your adversary, the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Second Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 11, the apostle Paul is speaking about the importance of forgiveness. And he's saying, you forgive, and so I choose also to forgive, but forgiveness is for this reason, and this is an important reason. I have forgiven the one for your sakes in the, pre in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take an advantage of us and we not are, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You see, the enemy is looking to take advantage of you. The good news is we are not ignorant. We are not uninformed. We are not stupid concerning the things of the enemy. I was never raised in church. My father forbid my mother to ever take us. I always believed there was a God, I just didn't know there was a God. And because I didn't know him, because I did not have an experience with him, I was subject to his schemes. And I believed and I embraced his schemes. And they almost destroyed me entirely. And I am so thankful as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ to be continually reminded by the Spirit of God that indwells me. Do you understand? Do you have a hand? Would you just show me your hand? Either one's fine. Put it up. There you go. Put it here. Do you know what you're touching? Yeah, my, it's not just your body. <laughs> it's not just your heart. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of the living Christ is here in you. There's no place you can go. There's no place that you can run to. You can The spirit of God is with you. And because he is with you, he is with you not just as a passenger in the back seat. He is with you to inform you, to bring to your remembrance, this is an attack. This is a scheme. This is something that the devil is trying to use to entrap you. We just have to learn to listen. It's not that the, that the Spirit of God is on vacation. It's just that sometimes we're on the wrong frequency. We can learn, we can learn to tune in. We can learn to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is trying to say in the moment. Uh, to take advantage, to, to have more, a greater part, a greater share, to be superior, to excel, suppress, to have an advantage over you, to overreach. That's what he wants to do. Second Corinthians uh, 2.11 in the message, we don't want to be unwittingly give Satan an opening for yet more mischief. We're not oblivious to his sly ways. Um, in the New Living Translation, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are very familiar with his evil schemes. Is there anybody here that thinks you're ignorant about the schemes of the enemy? It's okay, you can raise your hand. We'll pray for you after the service. You have experienced life. I've experienced 71 years of life. I have fallen subject to his schemes so many times, it's embarrassing. And mostly because I was focused on me, I was not focused on him. When our focus is on ourself, when our focus is on I've been offended. I didn't get the raise. Someone spoke, when, when the focus becomes here, 
It's amazing how deaf we become. When our focus is on ourself, we hear that chattering of the enemy. And it's so difficult to hear the truth of the Spirit when our focus is on ourselves. There's no extra charge for that, by the way. Revelation 12, 9. For the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the world. Who's he talking about? You and me. We are the world. We're the church. We are the world. He deceives us. He de- have you ever been deceived? I have been deceived. I have been. On more than one occasion. To lead away from the truth. To lead into error. To be led aside from the path of virtue. To go astray to sin. To sever or to fall away from the truth. Do you understand the scheme of the enemy? We haven't even gotten to them yet. This is just the introduction. The first one is doubt. When we doubt, we question God's word. We question his goodness. Satan attacks us with doubt when we are most vulnerable. When we have extended sickness, when we go through extended times of trial, when we have experienced a defeat, when we're just down and out, you are more susceptible than when you're up on a high. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? So this morning we started this service with a word from the Lord. Are you here and experiencing some kind of a demonic attack? And hands went up. And the body responded. And prayer was issued. That's the way every service should start. To doubt is to call into question the truth. To lack confidence in to consider it really unlikely. Does God really love me? When he looks down from heaven and he sees me, does he really see someone of incredible worth and value? Surely not me. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to Christians And I ask them, do you believe that when God sees you, he sees someone of great worth and value, someone who is precious and loved? And they look at me and they say, not really. They doubt. For God so loved the world. You can put your name in there. For God so loved John. He so loved Anne. He so loved Betty. He so loved George. He so loved you that he sacrificed his very best. Is that not love? But yet the enemy wants you to believe he did that for the other person, but he didn't do that for you because you're such a mistake. What a screw up. You're never going to get it right. How many times have people prayed over you? How many times have you gone into counseling? Nothing has worked. Everything is broken. Surely the word of God doesn't apply to you. I mean, seriously, loser. The scheme of the enemy to cause you to doubt the truth of the living word. We see it all the way back in the book of Genesis. This is such an amazing story about Eve and Adam in the garden. Now the serpent was the shrewdest of all creatures the Lord God had made. And here's how he starts his conversation. Really? Really, he asked the woman, did God really say You ever had the enemy whisper that into your head? Did God really say that he wants you to prosper and be in health as your soul prospers? Did he really say that to you? And she started listening. Oh, she did. You must not eat of the fruit of the garden. 
Oh, of course we may eat it, the woman told him. It's only the fruit from the tree at the center of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God says we must not eat it or even touch it or we will die, which actually is not exactly what the Lord said to her. She's listening to the voice of the enemy. He's sowing doubt into her mind and all of a sudden the sure word of the Lord changed. It morphed. You won't die, precious woman of God, hallelujah. You know, sometimes the the scripture says sometimes Satan appears like an angel of light. I've never seen him with a pitchfork in his hand or, or dressed in red except for, you know, a couple of weeks from now when kids start knocking on my door. I hate Halloween personally. Just... Anyway, moving right along. The doubter is characterized by hesitation. Uncertainty throws the doubter off balance, interferes with their decision making. The opposite is true with faith. James 1, 5 through 8. Such a cool scripture. I love this scripture. If you need wisdom, if you want to know what God wants you to do, just ask him. Oh, but the heavens are brass. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed. It's like I can just reach up, grab my prayer, and just pull it right back down. I never got out of the building. If you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him. He will gladly tell you. He will not resent your asking. But when you ask him, be sure that you really expect him to answer for the doubtful mind is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. People like that should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Thank you very much for that. I'm so glad I came to church today. You just told me I can pray, but because I doubt, I'll never hear the voice of the Lord. Well, except for one very important thing, again, which Pastor Paul talked about this morning. Because sometimes the answer comes through the body. Praise God for the body I pity those who are in isolation, who do Christianity by themselves. So dangerous. They've succumbed to the lie of the enemy. You don't know, but you see, I went to church and I was hurt. You, I mean, I could tell you a story that would make you cry. I was so hurt, I can't, I was hurt by my pastor. I was hurt by Sister Sandpaper. I was wounded by Brother Trouble. Why going to church? Why would anybody go to a place where you're just going to get butchered and massacred? Why I'm just going to, just me and Jesus, hallelujah. That's a lie of the enemy. It's a lie of the enemy, but there are so many that hang on to that lie because they're still hanging on to the wound. I've been hurt, and I've been hurt in church. Man, there ain't no mean like church mean. <laughs> <laughs> There's no mean like church mean. Um, been crucified several times, quite thoroughly, um, but it's just a memory. It's just a memory. I love the body of Christ. He died. He placed me in that body. I'm not going to doubt the validity of the body, as some do. That great dragon cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the world. Beware of doubt. Faith is the subtle chain that binds us to the infinite. Elizabeth Oaks Smith. And then this author, is no, I tried to find, could not find the author. Doubt sees the obstacles. Faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkness night, but faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step. Faith soars on high. Doubt questions who believes, and faith says, I. I like that. The second one is discouragement, and doubt and discouragement are like kissing cousins. Most of the time, you'll find one, you'll find the other. Discouragement makes you look at your problems rather than God. Oh my goodness, how true that is. The 
problem becomes so huge, we become myopic. All we see is the problem. We can't see past the problem to the promise. There is a promise with every problem that you face. But doubt tied to discouragement, you just don't understand. I have a dear friend who's a pastor. He is diabetic. The last time I talked to to my friend, he was doing um, uh, um, dialysis twice a week. Twice a week. I was talking to him one day, just sitting in his office visiting, and I said, what's wrong with your eye? He said, well, I I woke up in pain last night, and I went to the ophthalmologist, and I'm, I'm blind. There's nothing they can do. They don't have to remove the eye but I can no longer see out of the eye. Never heard a discouraging word from that man. For someone to say, I know how you feel, is one of the stupidest things anybody can ever say to someone who's in trouble. Unless, of course, you have walked in their shoes. If you have experienced a rape, then you can say, I think, in part, I know how you feel. If you've experienced an abortion, I think you could say legitimately, I know in part how you feel. If you've ever been forcibly terminated, if you've gone through a divorce or the death of a loved one, you could probably say, in part, I know how you feel. I could never say to him, I know how you feel. And life goes on, and a year later, we're talking again, sitting in his office, and we've been praying for his wayward daughter. His daughter got pregnant, ran off with the guy. The guy beat her so severely that she miscarried the baby. She came home. She came home to mom and dad. Never heard a discouraging word from this man worked with a woman who experienced chronic pain every single day. Chronic pain every day. You would never, ever know how her body is ravaged. She had every reason to be, every reason to be discouraged, but she refused to be that because it's like, you know what? In spite of the pain in my body, There is a joy in my soul because I'm in relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's a joy in my soul that is greater than the pain that I feel because I have a home in heaven. But then I've talked to others who are so wrapped up in discouragement, so bound, so incredibly distressed, to deprive of confidence, to deprive of hope, to try to prevent by expressing disapproval or raising objections. Matthew 11, 2 and 3. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Do you understand John He's in prison. He's about to lose his head because he just dared to speak the truth of God's word. John is the one who is baptizing people at the river and Jesus walks up and says, John, I must be baptized. No, no, no. I am, I am not even fit to take the sandals from your feet. John, baptize me. And he declares, behold the Lamb of God. And now he's in prison. He's he's doubting. He's, He's so surrounded by his circumstance. I'm just trying to be obedient. I'm just trying to live for God. I'm just trying to speak the truth. And in speaking the truth, I will now forfeit my life. And he is discouraged. And he says, would you go and 
find out, is, is he really the Messiah? Is this the guy that we've been waiting for? Can you imagine that? John being so pressed down that now he begins to question the very prophetic word that he spoke over the Christ. Ever been there? It's a terrible place, the dark night of the soul. I have a friend, some of you know, Terry Wardle, who experienced that. I won't go into his story. Exodus 6, the people of Israel, they've been in bondage, they've been in slavery for decades. The Lord hears their cry, he hears their cry. He raises up Moses, sends Moses in. Moses is trying to speak to the people I am the answer to your prayer. Therefore say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression. Anyone here need to hear that word? Do you need to be freed from oppression? And I will rescue from your slavery. I was a slave to sin. Drugs, alcohol, pornography, masturbation, you name it. I was in such incredible bondage. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people. I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you to a land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your own possession. I am the Lord. So Moses told the people of Israel what the Lord had said, but they refused to listen anymore. They had become so discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. They have prayed for decades, for generations. God, please send a deliverer. Send a deliverer. The deliverer comes and they're so discouraged they can't even receive him. How many times? Do we find ourselves in that situation? God, please send something, an answer, something, a knot to hang on to, something. And the something comes. And we just can't see it because we are so beaten down, so discouraged, and the lies of the enemy are so incredibly loud that we cannot hear the soft, subtle whisper of the Holy Spirit. And David said to his son Solomon, and I believe God is saying this to us in this season, be strong and of good courage and do it. Do not fear nor be dismayed for the Lord your God, my God will be with you. He will, leave, he will not leave you or forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord Let me tell you what I believe about the people that I see here today. I believe you're called. I believe that you are handpicked, that you are chosen. I believe that you are chosen for a purpose, that you are people that have a destiny, but the enemy has done everything he can to hold you back, to sidetrack you, to cause you to doubt to discourage you. And I believe the word of the Lord is be strong and of good courage because with the thing God has called you to do, it's going to happen. It is going to, hello, it is going to happen. Be strong, be of good courage, gird up the loins, believe the word of the Lord, it's going to happen. You're so silent. I don't think you believe me. Proverbs 12, 25. Worry weighs a person down. An encouraging word cheers them up. How many of you need an encouraging word this morning? The Lord loves you, my sister. Do you know how precious you are to him? You don't begin to know, trust me. 
It is more than you could even imagine. Just one person needed an encouraging word. I'm glad I came today. <laughs> Galatians 6, 9 and 10. So let, let's not get tired in doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. What does the enemy want you to do? I want you to fall into doubt. I want you to be discouraged. I want you to just give up. Why are you still beating your head against the wall that's never going to come down? Go home and whine. Just give up. You really believe God is going to bless you? I mean, suck it up, buttercup. It ain't going to happen to you. It, can you see that in church? I guess I just did. All right. <laughs> Sometimes I need to think before I speak. Ah, yes, indeed. Therefore, whatever you, whenever you have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. And I see you this morning back from your mission trip. And it was so exciting for us to sow into you so that you in turn could sow into the lives of others. And I'm really excited to hear about what God did because I'm sure it was very special. Are you thinking about quitting? You know, I'm thinking about, I keep referencing Pastor Paul because he's my hero. <laughs> you didn't know that. <laughs> but I remember, what, I remember so many things he says. We were talking, he was sharing about the fact that we raised the money to buy some property. And then he went on to say, my words, not his, my understanding of his message, when we're not giving up on the rest because we believe that that is for us, for the good of the kingdom, for the good of our community. We're believing God is going to come in. Amen and amen. We're not going to give up until the deed is signed and the church's name is on it. Amen. We're not going to stop doing good just because we're discouraged. We're not going to stop doing good just because maybe we're doubting whether the good is any good at all. We're just not going to do it. 2 Thessalonians 2. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal comfort and a wonderful hope comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. My dear brother, you want to come to the keys there? Pastor Paul's going to come up and close the service. If you're here this morning or when they post the tape, if you find yourself struggling with doubt or discouragement, please know one thing, God is for you. He will never leave you, he will never forsake you because you are his beloved. Amen. That's a powerful word. You're not just his friend. My wife was my friend, then I decided to marry her. Now she's my beloved. He married you. He brought you into the kingdom. He sees you. You are a person of incredible worth, a person of immeasurable value. He loves you. He is for you. He is not against you. There is one who is against you, but greater is the one that is in you than the one that can ever come against you. Say that with me. Greater is he that is in me than he that can come against me. Pastor Paul. Amen. I think the enemy's in deeper trouble than he was before <laughs> over the next few weeks. Thank you, George. We should uh, follow this word with action um, because one of the words going on in the body to the body 
um, through multiple people right now is that he is releasing gifts. Will you speak the words? I don't have them. Uh, the Lord was saying to me the other day that He has a gift. He has gifts of the Spirit for each one of us. And that for everyone there is a gift. Every single, at least one. <laughs> you know, there's more. There's always more. But He said um, He doesn't want us to be afraid of them. And He wants us to earnestly desire them, just like the Word of God says. Uh, that we would earnestly desire the gifts of the Spirit. And um, the Lord said, I'm ready to just give them to the people who earnestly desire them and ask for them. He's ready. That's what He said. And I believe, see, this resonated with the word the Lord was already speaking to me. Um, you may notice that in the Word of God there are there are basically three listings of gifts. Now you will read other parts and passages where gifts are manifest and it's not part of those three listings, but there's basically three listings. The interesting thing about those listings is that um, they have some overlap. You'll see gifts that are named across the different lists. But the other thing that you will notice is that... Um, they're not the same. So, and I personally think it was deliberate by the Lord, by the Lord in his word. I think if, if he made two lists exactly the same, then, then we'd be like, okay, that's, that's it. Then they're, they're, there they are. That's what they look like. And what I, this has taken us somewhere. What I take from that is that the Lord wanted us to know that, that I don't believe there's such a thing as the same gift, exactly the same twice in all of eternity because he tells us that he's the gift he also says well you all know what the inheritance of the Lord is do you know what the Lord what Jesus's inheritance is George talked about it this morning kind of yeah it's you you are the Lord's inheritance you are the gift so the gifts of the Spirit manifest through the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I'm convinced you have the gift of God like nobody else who ever lived or ever will. And it's going to be your gift through all, through all eternity. It's, it's tied to your identity, what God created. I guess I can't help myself but preach on Sunday morning. And um, so here's where I'm going with this. I think we're going to have a whole series coming up on this. But here's where just this morning, from the powerful things that God just um, spoke to his bride through George, I believe that we're supposed to, to execute, um, you step out in faith in some of those gifts right here this morning. Do you guys believe that? And we're going to come against doubt and discouragement. So... Um, for all who want to, here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to show us who we're supposed to go to, um, to pair up with this morning. Okay? So we're going to cause a little chaos on purpose. <laughs> okay? Now, you know that the Lord opens your eyes. The Lord, the Lord wants you to see what he sees. He wants you to say what he's saying and do what he's doing. Do you guys believe that too? Okay, so in just a second, I'm just going to pray, and then I want you to look around the room, and again, ask permission. This is all about respect. Somebody may, may say, no, thank you. They're not in that place this morning, and that's okay. But I want you to look around the room and ask the Lord, who should I be on the move to get over to? Because he supplies everything um, he supplies everything that the body needs with himself, with his body, which is you guys. Okay? You ready for this? And I'll lead you through. You don't have to. This is not scary. Lord, we bind fear in the name of Jesus. This is not a place where fear is allowed. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask you to show us, as we look around the room right now, show us who we're to move over to so that there can be a release of your gifts against any discouragement, any doubt this morning. And, and go ahead and do it, church. Look around. Who's he moving you toward? Nobody's exempt.
Nobody's exempt. <laughs> no fear. I bind fear in the name of Jesus. There's nothing scary about this. I know we only saw one, one person who said they, they needed a word of encouragement. I don't believe it. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Before you jump into any prayers or multiplications of words, I want you to just, um, to just look at each other. Okay? And one of the words today was, if you need wisdom, ask the Spirit. Now, do we need to know what the Lord has for them? What the Lord wants to do? We do, don't we? Don't we? If we're going to do what the Father's doing, if we're going to say what the Father's saying, then we need that. So take a moment before you start speaking and just look at them. And, and in your heart, you're asking the Holy Spirit, Lord, what do you want to give them? Trust yourself. If you had a thought, if you had a single word, if you had a picture, you ask the Lord, why wouldn't we believe that he would show us how he wants to love them in this moment? Trust yourself. You have the Holy Spirit. If the Lord showed you something, you don't have to add a bunch to it. The Lord knows just exactly how to love. Now, if you haven't done this switch, I don't mean part, I don't mean partners, but switch now and speak what you've received for them. If you need to take a moment and listen more, that's okay. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. And now, Father, we know that you are the one who acts. We know that it is a miracle to have faith in your word, to be delivered from doubt, and, and to feel encouraged when the enemy wants to bring discouragement. We know that these are miracles. So, Lord, we just want to end the service by honoring you and saying that we believe that your miracles are on the move that you're preparing us for, for a harvest field that is right here at our back door and around the world. You are doing this. We, we've been struck with discouraging situations, but, but um, we know that it is your miracle that allows us to have the faith that frees us from the discouragement. And so we exalt the name of Jesus in this place and we declare our faith before a spiritual audience. We say all doubt and discouraging assignments over this body are now canceled. And we ask you, Lord, to give us the faith to walk in it, to empower your word by, by the belief that is your gift to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.